7.30 in the a.m. and you are Listen, you don't tell me if I'm drunk or not. In ensemble movies, especially found footage ensemble movies, it can be a little confusing who the protagonist is, or at least who we should be sympathizing with. Chronicle introduces our main character with the mirror, since we don't see him much when he's behind the camera, sets up his motivation for almost everything he does, feeling weak because of an alcoholic abusive father and wanting to protect his mother, and introduces the literal lens through which we're told the story. Solid device. Also, spoilers, right? Because the sword is like the spear at the end. X-Men shadowing? Nah. <laughs> Sincerity or, like, vulnerability? I mean, who didn't like this song in 2011? Have you ever read any Arthur Schopenhauer? So, basically, you're telling me that I should give up on life. Yes. Philosophy lessons. I'm gonna hang back a while, okay? Uh, you're gonna be late for first period. I'm gonna talk about some of the narrative things this film does throughout, and this is one of the first that some will probably disagree with me about. But open-ended plot threads give this world a sense of further realism. Why'd he skip class? Getting high? Doesn't matter. Andrew didn't record it if he told him, so it's not in the footage. I thought you wanted me to come with you. I did, I did, but just go and do your own thing for once, okay? Abandoning Andrew at a party, he bullied him into attending. The one thing Matt does to Andrew that's worse than impaling him. It's a win because I hate Matt. More on that later. <laughs> a few frames is all it took for him to realize he was being creepy. I'm filming for my vlog. Oh. Andrew. You should check it out. It's Andrew. actually. Oh, hey, hey, Casey. Sorry, Casey. No one with that name could ever make it as a video blogger. It's pretty lame, right? Why is it lame? I'm not one to clamor to be cool, you know? That much is clear, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey, what did Young say about glow sticks? Philosophy burn. Yeah, I got a, I got a thing for phases, which is why I'm going into politics. I haven't seen this movie since the theater, so I don't exactly remember what happens, but I feel like you won't be making it to politics or graduation or the end of this movie. Ironically enough, because I'm so ridiculously Modesty. Andrew, can you give us some light? Matt, don't be now? an idiot. Since it's almost Halloween, this is about as much horror as you can expect from me. But it's nice to see kids do horror-level stupid stuff in a non-horror movie. You ever heard of Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Yes, Matt. Yes. He's heard of it, because everyone's heard of it. Although based on you bringing it up here, I don't think you have any clue what it's about. Which is a perfect addition to your lost in the world trying to fit in character. Also just getting out the horror, I may be doing a horror movie next week and it's not paranormal activity. Point being, the way they get their powers is a little creepy, so it makes sense that one of them goes off the deep end. We have to document this. I was a guy who defended the time jump in Fan Stick, but this is a Josh Trank time jump that works and makes sense in universe. Andrew being quicker at picking up precision things like this is consistent throughout and sets up how much more powerful he is by the end. Wait, is, is Andrew just a master builder? You don't feel like it's a little weird? Like it puts a barrier between you and everything else? Long before Casey Neistat revolutionized the vlog, Michael B. Jordan predicted the ultimate outcome. I've actually been having some problems with my parents too. Yeah, I mean, they're nothing like yours. I mean, not like that. I just... These are the nuggets of inventive storytelling that we get from Josh Trank and Max Landis. Steve doesn't come out and say, you know, because I know that your mother is very sick. It's inferred and we get it. It's exposition you don't even notice unless you're looking for it. Like me. Quick mirror shot again to establish who is holding the camera. The only thing they've done so far that I'm actually jealous of. I think Andrew missed his calling as a camera operator with that smooth rack focus. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan is always a win. We're just... Mormons! <laughs> That's like real cringy high school dialogue. Clearly not something written by a witty team of 30-somethings. I love the actual visualization of the car being pushed. It's not like a controlled, gentle hand. It's as if you can see this big, barely functioning claw just ripping the car off the road. Telekinesis that makes sense to me. Saving that stupid redneck. Is it a game or I something? I don't understand how you guys can be so angry. Andrew, look at me. You put a guy in the hospital. This is really the first hint that they needed to be more careful with Andrew. His concept of right and wrong isn't clearly defined yet. It also seems to be him already struggling with the idea that he's a more evolved life form. Look up. Hello, boys. Now that's an entrance. Uh, All right, how do we get down? <laughs> how do we get down? Smash cuts in the clouds. Again, we've already heard this conversation, so this time we just jump to Steve having won the argument. You've probably heard people talk about how great the CGI is and wondered, but what? You have to remember that it was made for $12 million, so it's killing it at that budget. But besides that, what a perfect picture of what high school guys would do. 20,000 feet up, but still just chillin'. The flying is one of the more entertaining aspects of this movie, and the first person point of view always keeps it feeling realistic. And they were smart enough to go up above the clouds so no one would see them. 
I never really thought of planes as all that scary, like on an individual level, but that one is terrifying. Andrew, you saved my life! Oh, oh my god! You saved my life! Thankfulness. How are you guys so cool, man? Liquid nitrogen. All right, everyone, <laughs> chill. Today was like, I think, the best day of my life. Honesty, and a type of honesty a lot of us can relate to. It's not easy to be genuine about things like this, and I believe it from each of them. You know, <laughs> Matt, you can just mail this yourself. I'm not your mom. Charity burn. I can't do that. I can't do stuff that requires finesse. Which actually makes sense for why Steve was the first to fly and Andrew was the first to stop the ball. Finesse versus raw power, and also caution versus fearlessness. And this floating camera effect was done with a cable cam rig, which is exactly what it sounds like. But it all just works so well and gives it that floaty feeling. Ha! <laughs> that looks like the Cave of Wonders opening, where you'd find a genie who could give you special powers. Uh, uh. Let's talk about how Steve orchestrated this magic show so that Andrew was the only one to look cool, even though there were plenty of things he could have done that don't require finesse. You're the man to You're the man of the hour. Okay, Dude, come on, man. Everybody's been waiting for you. I mean, it's not that hard to believe. Everybody loved Chris Angel for like 10 minutes. I, I actually could be good at that right now. I actually could be good at this right now. Literally every beer pong pro several beers into the night. I mean, look, that's awesome, but everybody plays that you can block bounces. That is Anna Wood, Dane DeHaan's actual wife. That vulgarity, extended family, all night. Family, not Peter Parker, but Green Goblin finally got his day. I went through your camera. What did you see? Just you being a loser. You think that those people are your friends? They're not. You're an embarrassment. What a moment that hammers home how terrible his dad is. There's at least the potential that Andrew's dad saw him flying or doing otherwise telekinetic things, and still, he only sees his son as an embarrassment because he hates himself that much. You saw me, an idiot! Ah! Powerful statement about abused kids. Andrew doesn't immediately defend himself because of course he wants to think his dad isn't gonna hit him this time, no matter how many times he has before. But then the dad gets some comeuppance. Another jump cut that makes sense. Of course Andrew isn't gonna film himself trying to resuscitate Steve or once Steve is dead. But also, is this how Johnny Storm actually became the Human Torch? Ugh, the way Andrew doesn't want his face on camera right now is if he's accepting that he's the villain of his own story. And he doesn't put his face back on camera for another minute and a half, and when he does, it's with this shot. Withered flowers to show the passing of time. You know what? No. This powered him up to become Creed. This one I got really clean because I did this little, like, lasso thing around the root. And then Andrew starts to really lose it. Interestingly, I think the edit is a little out of order. But for Flo, they left it like this. Pulls teeth, talks about being the apex, watches footage back. I like to think that he actually watched the footage back after pulling Wayne's teeth and sort of realized he was acting crazy. So then went on to explain... A lion does not feel guilty when it kills a gazelle. And I think that means something. Yup. I mean, he gray, but still. Yup. And the spiders from Mars, they play the left hand. David Bowie is always a win. Further disconnecting from people by now putting an actual barrier between himself and them. And it's no coincidence that the very thing he showed respect for his father over is now one of his tools to break free. Also more awesome practical effects showing how little he cares about dragging the ants around. This is a multiple viewings level detail, which is the stuff I love because the filmmakers know very few people are going to catch it in theaters. But they put it in there anyway. Have you noticed it yet? Andrew's hovering camera is in the security footage. And the continuity between cuts is pretty impeccable. Attention to detail. Still keeping everything as found footage as possible. Obviously Andrew isn't recording anything when he's unconscious. Camera needs to stay on for our investigation. That might seem like a little bit of a stretch, but I think your right to reasonable privacy goes out the door when law enforcement has clear evidence of you doing supernatural things. Your mother's dead. She died last night while I was out looking for you. If I just could have been there or you took me away. I want you to apologize to me. Oh good, blame the kid. Just when you think maybe this guy is an actual human, he blames his son for the death of his wife and demands an apology if there was ever a clear motivation for a character's snap. And one thing that might go unnoticed is that Andrew is awake at this point, literally filming his own life with a push-in so that this moment is more dramatic. It plays into how detached from humanity he is and how he sees himself as separate and above the rest of the world. Props on the alien shirt. Where are your keys at? What? Just yeah, stay here, I'll be back. I, I just have to drive there, okay? In case you're wondering why Matt doesn't just fly to Andrew, his nose was already bleeding, so he's weakened. Also, how would he explain running off into the night to Casey? 
Saving that abusive jerk. The original script had Andrew doing a similar thing to his dad he did to the spider, and I appreciated that they changed it to this. Some may still walk away hating Andrew and thinking he got what he deserved, but to me, his story is tragic and unfair. More on that later. I love the point of view flip, making Andrew irrefutably out to be the villain of his own story now. Oh! Hold on to me! Hold on to me! This is just an insanely awesome sequence from start to finish that is one of the main reasons you do found footage films. Everything is amplified by the first person point of view. I'm an apex predator. An apex predator with a flair for the dramatic, honking that horn telekinetically. I also love how this outfit, the bandages, the one exposed bloodied arm, even the scars on his face are such perfect supervillain trappings. It would probably sully this movie, but even after Andrew's death, there's room for a sequel. The shifting point of view also creates these visual effects cheats. It keeps you in the finale because there's never an omnipresent camera catching the best angles, it's just what's available. So a car flip is seen from inside. Ooh, man, that glass slowly lifting off the ground. And now, setting your finale to take place in public makes having all the camera angles at your disposal easy. Smart play. So he's kneeling pretty well, but this is kind of a simplified, supernatural-wise, live-action adaptation of Akira. Really think about the similarities, and I'm good with that. The intensity and desperation on both kids' faces and in their voices. Brutal. Another stellar conveyance of the passage of time with the cuts on his face almost healed. I'm gonna find out what happened to us down there. I don't care how long it takes. I'm gonna get answers. And I'll never get over the loss of the Max Landis, Josh Trank time-traveling sequel that will never be. You're not a bad person. I know that. <laughs> I didn't ever get a chance to tell you, but I love you. I'm about to be hard on Matt, but I do love this moment of love he shares with the memory of Andrew and acknowledges that Andrew wasn't just pure evil. So Max Landis wrote this screenplay, you know him from Netflix's Bright, and possibly, if you take any of my recommendations, two of my favorite films from 2015, Mr. Wright and American Ultra. And while I give both directors of those films a bunch of credit for visual style, Landis has a way with words. It's in those films and it's in Chronicle. It's hard to tell who was responsible for what, but Josh Trank also has a writing credit. My assumption is that Landis brought the screenplay to Trank and then they reworked it together. But the way this story is laid out, whoever gets more credit, it's, it's just great storytelling. Short and sweet, or well, not sweet, but concise. Concise and tragic. Good storytellers use the elevator pitch for a movie just as the framework to tell good stories. The powers these kids have are just a way to amplify what it sometimes feels like to be a teenager. And in that way, it's ironically just a human story. I mentioned how characters very subtly acknowledge things that happen off screen to bring us up to speed with their relationships to each other. Their friendships are built so organically. I mean, you saw how my dad is, he just quiet. These are things I believe friends would say to each other. Really, this coming from the man who's always talking about how pointless life is. It's quality writing. So here's my take, and it's maybe a little bit of a stretch. I think you can interpret this movie as a satirical indictment of the infallibility of the good guy, who in this case is our hero, Matt. Matt is a jerk. He belittles Andrew right from the beginning. He clearly sees himself as better than Andrew and tries to distance himself to save face. Then he knocks this guy over, moves this poor waitress's cart so she breaks some plates, and then murders his cousin. Okay, the last one is at least a little bit on Andrew, but my point is that we're presented with a pretty unlikable guy who ends up finding purpose and vindication by the end. And not in a super redemptive way because he's responsible for Andrew in a lot of ways. Andrew is obviously the most interesting character. He's set up early as someone with reasons to explode, but you don't get bad guy of the group right off the bat. He's a bit of a loner and his only real acquaintance seems to be his cousin Matt, who we've established is not a great influence. So, in order to impress his new friends, he does this. He escalates the actions they took because fitting in is more important in the moment than any potential repercussions. And then Matt scolds him like a child who breaks a lamp after he just watched you throw it around the room. They have great moments together, and I believe they all loved each other. But ultimately, I see this story being about how a bad influencer led to Andrew's death. And don't misunderstand, we're all responsible for our own actions, and Andrew chose his path. It's just not the most unsympathetic path. And I understand how someone could walk out of this film thinking it was just a superhero origin story for Matt who saves the day, and a supervillain origin story for Andrew who just loses the plot. But I think it's more than that. When all the cards are down, sure, Matt sacrifices his best friend so that no one else gets hurt, and Andrew can't hear reason, seeing himself as the apex predator. By the time he's describing ripping a bully's teeth out by the technique rather than the emotion or even vengeance that was behind it, you know he's gone. But we're not just defined by the actions of one or even a few moments. This person wasn't created in a vacuum. The first interaction we see between Matt and Andrew is Matt expressing his nihilistic opinions. Everything that led Andrew and Matt to this showdown falls on both their shoulders, and I personally fault Matt more than Andrew. 
My wife and I have this ongoing discussion slash argument about any given thing that happens in the world and how far our sympathy should extend. Convoluted way of saying sometimes we feel bad for people who do bad things because I personally believe that most, well, a lot of the time, some of the time, people doing evil things just means something is broken in their brain. And it's often because of past trauma or just the way they were born. Again, and this is where I always concede to her, people are responsible for their actions regardless of what's going on in their head. I guess my point is that I don't have even an inkling of a desire to steal hats, while I believe some people have to fight that urge every day. I truly believe there are would-be hat stealers walking amongst us who, for one reason or another, by the grace of God, just don't steal any hats. And probably never will. Look, some people want to lick mailboxes, but they don't because they get that it's weird. But their urge to lick mailboxes may be just as strong as mine is to drink coffee in the morning. Maybe I've just watched too much Dexter. Maybe I'm a hopeless humanist. But if there was ever a clear line drawn to what, why, and how Andrew becomes what he becomes, it's here. It's a dying mother, abusive father, outcast of society, broken brain. Even when things are going great, things go terrible. And he hasn't been taught how to deal with this kind of disappointment. Steve doesn't even get it. So what? You threw up. If she really liked you, she wouldn't care. And if she doesn't really like you, who cares? It sucks, it's embarrassing, but this is not a person who is built to deal with this kind of failure. Oh, I... I didn't actually notice that he puked on her at first. Okay, well, her response is warranted. But still, if she actually likes you, this wouldn't be the end. All that to say, I think this film is something of a warning about how we interact with people. You never know what's going on at home or inside their heads, especially when it comes to young adults. Matt is like the quintessential high school senior who is about to have his entire worldview blown up next year in Freshman Philosophy 101, events of this film aside. But while he's responsible, or at the very least complicit in everything that goes down, the kid who's too cool for parties gets to keep on trucking while everyone else dies. And I get that there's a redemption arc on the surface as well. Kid who finds existence purposeless finds purpose. But I have a hard time seeing this movie as anything other than the jerk getting off mostly scot-free while the abused, underdog, outcast is brutally killed. Or maybe they're just typical high school kids and I'm reading way too much into it. Because we're his mistress. <laughs> but that's something I really like about this movie. It's not so clear cut how you're supposed to feel walking away. And that's not even talking about how Chronicle is an un-superhero film only comparable to Unbreakable where the powers are so cool and well executed they could be the focus but instead they're just the springboard for these character stories. So the characters are written really well but it would be dishonest to pretend like the actors weren't a huge part of selling the realism of this story. Dane DeHaan has had his hits and misses but even his arguable misses were at least consistent. Place Beyond the Pines, he was even pretty good in Amazing Spider-Man. Huh, he was a skinny panther in True Blood, totally forgot about that. Anyway, then we got my man Michael B. Jordan who's still blowing up and was easily the most likable character in the entire film, making his death all the more heartbreaking. And then Alex Russell is the only one who isn't at least halfway to a household name at this point. Ironically, the year after this, he was in the Carrie remake, which is basically what this movie is just with the gender swap. So there's some trivia for you. And none of the supporting cast got in the way or pulled you out of the film. Even Doug Stamper wasn't Doug Stamper yet. It's funny how often these found footage films work so well because of the no names, but then these films often launch careers, making them work less on rewatch. It still works. I buy that every one of them is just a high school kid going through puberty, right? That's the metaphor, right? Point is, I hope to see more from all of them, especially Trank, even if Fan Force Sick was a bit of a speed bump for him. But next week, a movie that I'm reiterating is not Paranormal Activity. Forty or fifty feet. Yeah, just don't talk about it, okay? You ever, you ever heard of Plato's Allegory of Decay? 